are in Romans chapter 15. I'm going to move into um, the, the, the last section of the letter today. I say that. Kind of it's the second to last section, technically. But wanted to say a few more things about the way he closes the discussion that really began at the beginning of chapter 12 regarding how the Christians ought to get along with each other, uh, specifically in relation to the fact that the Roman church is comprised of Christians who have become Christian after being, uh, let's say, Orthodox Jews, uh, and, and uh, Christians who were previously pagans, were, were, were Gentiles, and the different sensitivities of, of conscience. But then uh, it's very interesting how he wraps up that discussion beginning in verses uh, 8 and following, 8 to 13 basically. We'll start there after we pray. The Lord be with you. And also uh, with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that your faithfulness to us is uh, completely reliable. And we pray, Lord, that uh, trusting in the, the keeping of your promises to us, uh, we may constantly go about the work that you have called us to do uh, in, in all that we say and do in our lives. May the study of your word this morning uh, strengthen uh, our faith in you and help us to grow in love for you and for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, let's start in uh, verse... Oh. I, this, this was an example that uh, I always like to, to bring up in the context of what we've been talking about the last several weeks in Romans and the whole business of uh, deferring to the other, other's conscience, the, the one uh, weak in faith, uh, quote unquote. And uh, you, you know the phrase, when in Rome do as the Romans do? do? Do you know where we get that? What was the original context? Who originally said those words? Anybody know this? Shakespeare? No, no, not Shakespeare. Well, long before Shakespeare, actually. Not Paul. After Paul. So, uh, Bishop Ambrose. Uh, Bishop Ambrose was the uh, pa pastor, uh, a bishop under whom the very influential Saint Augustine became a Christian. And those of you who know the story of St. Augustine, you know that he lived the life of a pagan uh, until his 30s. And all those years, all those years, his mother, Monica, prayed for her son that, that, that he would be brought to faith in Jesus, that he would be converted. And, and, and God answered that prayer uh, by, by bringing him to faith through, among others, Ambrose sometime in Augustine's early 30s. It's Monica, Monica the mother of Augustine, who's visiting, let's see, Ambrose is in Milan, okay? And she goes to visit Rome and worships with the Roman Christians there. This is, by the way, uh, let's see, uh, Augustine dies in 430, so early 400s, you know, somewhere in the early 400s. She writes... Ambrose, writing in Rome, and she says, you know, I'm, I'm here in Rome, and the Christians here stand up for the hymns that we sit down for, and they sit down for the hymns that we stand up for. What should I do? I'm used to standing up for the sermon hymn, but here in Rome they sit down. Or, or, or you know, whatever it was, or vice versa. But it really was about the matter of standing down, you know, standing and sitting at different times than they did in the Milan church. And in Ambrose's letter back, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> See? But, but isn't that an application of what Paul is saying here? Right? Yeah, there's freedom in these matters. There's no thou shalt stand at this point and thou shalt sit at this point. There's freedom. But when, when you're at another congregation that's hosting you, as it were, you defer to them and, and, and don't, don't make a, a show of your freedom that has you sticking out like a sore thumb. And, and when the Romans come to the Milan church, they'll do as the Milanese do. That kind of thing. Uh, so, now, in beginning in verse 8, we read, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's 
truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So we, we have first off, uh, he became Christ himself. So, so Paul is, is, is now going to point to Jesus himself as an example of this kind of attitude of, of deferring, of, of, of serving the other, of, of counting the, the other more important than oneself. Uh, so he says, first of all, Christ became a servant to whom? The circumcised. What, what does he mean by that? Who are the circumcised? The Jews. the Jews. So this is a way of talking about the Jews, those who are circumcised going back to the, uh, the command given to Abraham to show God's truthfulness. So he's doing this so as to demonstrate to his own, Jesus is a Jew, that God is keeping the promise he always planned to keep, the promise he made back to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. He's keeping it in him, in Jesus. So he shows God's truthfulness to the circumcised this way in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarch and not just the Jews and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Why will the Gentiles glorify God for his mercy? They're included in the promise. What, 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 what's that, Maria? Because they're included in the promise. Because they're now included in the promise. This was, this was never the way the Gentiles conceived of it. It's certainly not the way the Jews thought of it. The Jews are in, everybody else is out. And the Gentiles had no, no reason not you know, to think otherwise. And now all of a sudden God says, no, you're in too. You get to participate in the blessings that at one point seemed to only be for the, the circumcised. So if that's how Jesus is, Right, welcoming all, Jew and Gentile, how much more ought we who benefit from this one salvation have that same attitude toward the other? Uh, another, uh, you know, if, if you want to see this elaborated on, go, you go to Ephesians chapter 2, where, where Paul deals with the whole dividing wall of hostility, that you had this wall in the temple that, that literally, physically divided circumcised from uncircumcised. Beyond this point, and there was even a, a plaque on the wall that said, if you're a Gentile and you cross this line, uh, be, be prepared to, to, to be killed by God. <laughs> no, for, for real. So, but that dividing wall of hostility has been torn down, raised to the ground in Christ, who in his body has reconciled all to God. So in the one human being, Jesus, all human beings have been made uh, right with God. And so uh, it's, it's not just for the Jew only. And now Paul's going to give us this whole series of quotations from the Old Testament that say that this is exactly uh, what was always in God's mind from the beginning. So uh, beginning with, uh, let's see. Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Uh, this is from... Uh, Let's see, Psalm 18, right? And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. So the Gentiles will find their hope in the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And, and we'll stop there before we move to a, a, a new section. Um, so uh, go to, I want to take you to one of the places that this gets quoted from. Go to Psalm 117. What's significant about Psalm 117? Anybody happen to know? It comes before 118. 
No, no, no. Uh, it's, um, it, it's the shortest. It's the shortest of all the songs. And it's just two away from the longest. 119. Yep. Tons of trivia. Yeah, it's tons, yes. Uh, I apologize. It's, uh, it's my equivalent of dad jokes on Father's Day, right? Uh, praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. So, um, you, you've got all peoples, and and. That that's not just saying everybody. It's saying all kinds of people, of all races, of all nations, of all ethnicities. See, no one's excluded in this. All join in their praise so that uh, we have a, a, a one way of salvation for everyone. It's not as though the Jews have their God and everybody else has their own. No, no, there's one God and He saves all of us. Um, that dividing wall has been, been broken down. Um, let's see, Root of Jesse will come, uh, the, the, the Pope from Isaiah. So we've got the fulfillment of a promise that for all those centuries, the, the, the Jews were the keepers of the the... So the Savior would be a Jew, would, would be a descendant of Jesse, and yet he would save more than just the Jews, he would save the Gentiles. So that, that the Gentiles would find their hope in this one who was born uh, of, of Jesse. Um, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Um, what does it mean to abound? Plenty. You've got plenty. <coughs> abundance. Abundance. Abundance in such a way that what happens? Not only do you not run out, but, but something else. You overflow. Yeah, another way to translate this word is overflow with hope. So, so think about, we've got kind of an equation set up here. Um, the, the Lord fills you with joy and peace, and what comes out of that, overflowing with hope. And what's the significance of, of putting it that way, of overflowing with hope? Yeah, you spread it. It becomes contagious. Others, others catch this hope from you. You who are filled with joy and peace. Yeah. It kind of reminds me, isn't there the old, um, it's, not a, it's not a Hans Christian Andersen story, it's, uh, but, but the, the, the magic porridge pot, do you know this one? Yeah. And, and, and not only that, but, but see, she gets some, she, she waves her wand, the, the, the mother gets the secret recipe, she waves the wand, and, and, it, and it creates porridge, right? But she forgets the spell that, that makes it stop. stop. And so the porridge just keeps pouring out and it fills the village. Okay? And now people are drowning in porridge. Uh, that's a, a nice picture for the way it is with the church and overflowing with hope. And everywhere we go, people see or, or can tell that there's, there's something different about us. Uh, and, and, and what is it? It's this joy and peace that we uniquely have in Christ. The, the other thing to say about this this closing um, part of, of the section that, as I say, began in, in chapter 12, where Paul begins by saying, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God. And, and now he's going to talk about our life together in the church, which includes, among other things, being submissive to the authorities, right? Uh, it includes uh, showing deference to, to one another with respect to different sensitivities of conscience as we've spent much time on, uh, of loving one another, of owing no one anything except love. Uh, that's the debt that never gets fully paid. Um, but he brings things at the end back to where he began. Back to where he began in the very opening of the letter. So go back to Romans chapter 1. And 
look at what is rightly understood as the thesis statement for the whole book of Romans. Uh, verse 16, Romans 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And remember what we said about not being ashamed? It's, it's not him saying, I'm not, I'm not personally embarrassed. No, no, he's not saying that. He's saying that he knows this gospel that he preaches will not bring shame to him. That he, to, to the extent the world uh, thinks him a fool for believing what he preaches, he knows on the last day he will be honored and glory, uh, you know, made, made, made glorious by the gospel that he preaches. He, he will not be, uh, be brought to shame and, and told, Paul, what were you thinking? He, he had it completely backwards. No, no, no. He's not ashamed. It will not bring him to shame, this gospel that he preaches. Why? It's the power of God for salvation to everyone. See, th there it is. R right off the bat, one of his themes is that this salvation is the same for everybody, including both the Jew and the Greek, but the Jew first. See, the Jews get it first. And, and then the mercy shown to the Gentiles in them being grafted in. Yes, Maria? I don't know if you're planning on touching on this, and this may be completely deviation, but... Doesn't it always scare you when things get so quiet? <laughs> you know, they're hanging on your... Okay, all right. No. It's like one of those EF button yeah. moments. So, I completely understand and know that Jesus came to save all of us. Yeah. Right? Like, that's a gift for everybody. Right. But how do you explain to people that think like he is actually saving everybody and there's no difference with like heaven and hell because I think people like I know that there's some uh, there's a term for it where it's like everybody's going to be saved on the last day no matter what oh sure right and right. so how do you like explain that or talk about that where it's like yes Jesus did come to save everybody right. but not everybody will be saved yeah yeah and, and I, I think with this particular verse mm -hmm. the thing to point out is here he's saying the gospel is the power of God for salvation mm -hmm. it really does have this power to save you mm -hmm. and, and, and the next um, pretty much through chapter 5 is all about him saying just that. That this truly is how any of us can have a righteousness that can actually count with God. It's, it's through faith in Christ, not by our own works. Mm -hmm. That's the power of God for salvation. However, like anything, to take, take electricity. Mm -hmm. There's a generator that truly is generating power at the power plant. But if my house isn't on the grid, mm -hmm. you see, and then from six on, now, it, now it's a whole matter of how do I get this power? Mm -hmm. How do I get this power? And it's by baptism and belief. Mm -hmm. How are we connected to this, this power source? He starts off in Romans 6. Do you not know that all of you who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And therefore we now walk in newness of life. The power is there. That's absolutely true. And that power is available to everybody. But it only benefits those who are connected to it. Okay. Who believe in it. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply that you know, everybody's in whether they rejected Jesus or not. Mm -hmm. Those who reject Jesus reject the power of salvation. Which truly would have saved them. Mm -hmm. But they chose to be saved some by some other means that didn't actually give them salvation. Yeah. Everybody follow that? Yeah? Um, so, so a big term from chapter 6 on, as we talked about at some length, is in Christ. Mm -hmm. In Christ. Uh, th think about the, the great climax to that, that chapters 5 through 8 section, there is, which begins in 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and then the last verse of that chapter, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. See, it's not just love of God blanket, right? Love of God, no, nothing to worry about. We're, we're all in, Hitler, Pol Pot, you and me. No, no, those of us who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. 
I, I, I heard a, a preacher the other day put it in a very hopeful way that um, you, know, you, you think of, of Jesus as the good shepherd, you know, the great image of him as the, as the good shepherd, and, and, and uh, the parable of the, uh, the, the, the 99 and, and, the, and the lost sheep, right? You've got the, 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 the shepherd goes after the one lost sheep. See, Jesus never loses his sheep. However, sheep can stray. See, that, that's the difference. That, that we can trust Jesus not to lose us. But we can also choose not to trust in Jesus and, and, and stray away. But if we're trusting in Jesus, Jesus ain't going to let us down. Right? That, that, that's, uh, okay. Not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, think about this, that the, the material that we've read for maybe the last five, six weeks, going back to the beginning of chapter 12, we, we hear so much of this as, okay, now Paul's getting into what the world would call ethics, practical behavior, your conduct, but, but for Paul, it's never that. It's never just that. If it, if it can even be thought of as that. right? How many times have we seen Paul put things in terms of not doing, but being. Being who you are in Christ. What does that look like? Well, you love as Christ loves. Did, did, did Christ shun or ostracize the Gentile? Of course not. He brought the Gentile in. And so you bring the other in as well. That kind of thing. Um, but, but notice, he, he's bringing things back around to the theological point that he started with. So everything that we do as, as Christians, it's never just practical matters. It's always a, a living consistent with what is theologically the fact. We are in Christ. We are his children. We have been loved by God first, to use First John language. And so now we love. We've been connected to him who is love, and therefore, the only consistent way to reflect that is to ourselves love one another. So it always comes back to, and, and it's more than just Jesus is the example, it's that you are part of Jesus now. You are members of the body of Christ. And so, of course, this is our attitude the, the Gentile towards the Jew, the Jew towards the Gentile. Now, I, I just think it's, it's amazing. Uh, and, and, and what a um, corrective recognizing that is for this, this very pernicious and false dichotomy that I, I, I don't know if it's as big a deal now. I'm not caught up in these kinds of debates the way I was in, in my seminary days. But, but, but you'll hear people who say, deeds, not creeds. Remember that as a slogan? Deeds, not creeds. Or um, it, it's, uh, it's not so much what, what Jesus would have you believe as what Jesus would have you do. And you can never separate the two. Right? The, the deeds of a Christian flow out of the, the, the doctrinal truth. Out of the reality that we have been saved by Jesus and made a part of God's family. So you, you can't have one without the other. You can't have only beliefs, right? To be hearers only. We must be doers as well. But then you also can't just be doers and so separate the, the fruit of, of the faith from the faith itself. And, and lo and behold, this is exactly how Paul teaches in all of his letters including this one. He brings things back to a theological truth that, that our attitude toward one another is grounded in this fact, the, the, the fact of the gospel. Any, any questions about that? Because now we do, in fact, move on to something a little different. What is it, Monty Python? Now for something entirely different? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, so be it. Um, oh, uh, uh, verse 13. What's the joy? What
what is our joy? Jesus first, out of second, yourself last. Yeah, but, 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 but the, the being filled with joy, it, it's, it's nearly always in the New Testament, joy in our salvation in Christ. That's our joy. What, what's our peace? What's peace referred to? Okay, th th that's where, but, but what is, what's meant by the word peace? What, knowing the truth leads to what? Reassurance. Yes, yes. Knowing that everything's going to be okay. Yeah, but w what did we have before we had this peace? Uncertainty. Well, but what's the opposite of peace? Chaos. Hostility, enmity. See, we were enemies of God because of our sin. We've now been reconciled to God, so we have peace with God. We are friends, not enemies any longer because of Christ. And therefore, because we have peace with God, there's also peace in the church. Those two things, joy and peace, joy in our salvation, peace with God and one another, leads to an overflowing of hope. Abounding, overflowing. Okay. Uh, beginning in 14, and we're going to take this as one block. 14 all the way to the end of chapter 15. But I want to say just a, a few things uh, before we start this. In ancient Greece and Rome, uh, there were certain conventions in not just letter writing, but, but certainly letter writing, public speaking, uh, rhetorical rules, rhetoric. Rhetoric had to do with, with, with applying rules to uh, writing a letter, writing and delivering a speech. And it's clear from all of Paul's letters that Paul was speaking this, that, that Paul very much follows the rules of ancient Greek and Roman rhetoric. So that anyone in Paul's own day reading a letter would recognize that Paul is following these conventions and so the sections of his letter correspond to the sections anyone trained in rhetoric would expect to appear and in the order that they appear in a particular letter. And, and so likewise, we're moving into a section that an ancient Roman would, would absolutely always expect to be at this point in the letter He's moved from the teaching portion of the letter, and he's now moving to what we may say is the, it, are, are more kind of housekeeping items. And, and he's talking to them directly in their own situation about things that, that, that just have to do with this and that, not to do with the, 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 the teaching body of the letter that, that preceded. And I bring all that up because you know, one of the ways I could have taught this class is I, I could have pointed out, flagged all the, the change in sections and shown you how those correspond exactly to what you would expect an ancient rhetorical writer to do. Uh, in, in the ancient Roman days, before that ancient Greek days, uh, rhetoric was the highest form of education. That was, that was, those were the high school years. You started off with grammar, you, you, you learned the rules of the language, the alphabet. Logic was the next stage. You learned how to uh, uh, apply those rules and recognize uh, the, those rules uh, as played out. But then finally, rhetoric was having learned grammar and logic. Now you yourself are going to express those rules by writing and speaking things. Paul's a great rhetorician. Why bring this up? To remind you that Paul is never simply dumping facts on us. He has an intention, a goal. He, he, th th there, he's going to choose his words in a way that leads to the outcome he wants. And so we're going to see differences in the way he's talking to the Roman Christians from the way he talks to the Corinthian Christians, the Thessalonian Christians, the Galatian Christians. And we'll especially see that here. And I'll, I'll call your attention to that. And so always to ask yourself, okay, why does Paul put it this way? Or why does Paul not put it the way he puts it in this other letter? 
And, and, and they're, they're good answers to this. Okay. So in verse 14, I myself am satisfied you about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I'll not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it's written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I've longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I've completed this and have delivered to them what's been collected, I'll leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Okay. Um, he starts by saying, I'm satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct, instruct others. Right? All knowledge and able to instruct one another. Why might he say that now? And think back to Paul's relationship with the Roman church. What's unique about the Roman church in relation to Paul as compared to all the other church letters that we have of Paul? He's never been here. He's never been there. All the other churches that Paul writes, Paul either started them or was very close to the planting of them. So why might, after all that we've read up to this point, does Paul now insert this kind of, of note about, now I know you guys know this. What, what, what might people think, having heard Paul's letter up to this point? That they don't. Yeah, that, that, uh, that, that Paul, by going on and on for, for 15 chapters, I mean, of course, it wasn't divided into chapters when they first got it. You know, the person reading it to the congregation didn't say, chapter 2, <laughs> chapter 3. Uh, that, that, that was not a convention of ancient letter writing. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't that be funny to write a letter and, and divide it into chapters and verses? I may do that with some of you. Uh, so, uh, but, but up to this point, th that they would naturally think, who does Paul think he is? And who does Paul think we are? We're Christians for crying out loud. We know this stuff already. Why is he talking to us? as if we've never heard of Jesus before. And so he's, he's, he's being quick to say, look, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to you as if I think you don't know it. I'm saying it to you by way of reminder, and remember, because they don't know Paul, Paul is, is, is letting them know, look, when you can welcome me, 
This is the gospel I preach. It's the gospel that was preached to you and that you believe in. So that when Paul comes, they, they don't have to sort of uh, interrogate him and, and, and put him through the ringer. Uh, they, they, they've gotten this letter. Okay, Paul, you're good. We, we, you're, you're one of us. Uh, but, but notice that's exactly Paul's attitude toward them. He's treating them more as equals than he does in others, other of his letters where he's writing to churches that he started. In other letters that Paul writes, Paul will often appeal to the fact that what? What, what is Paul big on appealing to? Especially in his Corinthian letter, but in his Galatian letter, big time in Galatians. Yeah, he's correcting them, and part of his part of his appeal is reminding them what? That's more the Romans letter. What's his appeal, and especially Corinthians and Galatians? We studied these several years ago, people. <laughs> Do you not remember? He appeals to his being an apostle. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Who are you to contradict me? He doesn't do that with the Romans. He didn't start that church. And so he's going to go, he's going to take the long way to get to the same places he gets to with the other churches by simply saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Here's the truth. Instead, what do we see so much of in Romans? This is the gospel. Let me prove it to you from the scriptures. See? That's why Romans gets kind of pride of place in the New Testament. Because it is like that in a way that the others aren't. That, that it's, it's, it's more a, a thorough exposition of the whole faith in a way that the other letters are more occasional, where, where Paul is addressing a particular issue that's, that's cropped up in that particular church that he already has a relationship with. Not so the Roman church. And so um, we, we saw this earlier in the letter, this kind of deference that Paul will show to the Roman Christians so as never to imply that he somehow thinks of himself as above them, as over them. Um, look at... Uh, going back to chapter 1, uh, verse 11. Same spirit here is at work in Paul's choice of words as uh, here as they are in uh, chapter 15. He says, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. But he doesn't leave it at that. Because see, that just by itself suggests, well, uh, do we need a spiritual gift? Or are, are we somehow lacking, Paul? What, what have you heard about us? What are people telling you, Paul? No, no, he biblically adds. You know, he, he might have reworded the, the start of the sentence if he had backspace on his keyboard or liquid paper, but he doesn't. So he's going to correct it in real time by saying, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. See, we're, we're, we're equals in this. And so... Don't, don't get me wrong when I say I look forward to imparting to you a spiritual gift. I equally look forward to you imparting a spiritual gift to me. And, and so he's doing likewise the same here in, uh, in, in Romans 15 beginning in verse 14. I myself am satisfied you, uh, about you, my brothers. You yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder. And it, it, it'd be fun. I, I wish we could... Uh, uh, read Paul's mind here. I wonder which parts he meant by that. You know, w which parts did he consider bold uh, as compared to, 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 to the rest? But uh, because of the grace given me by God to be what? A minister. Any guesses as to what the word here for minister is? What, what, what do you have? Not servant. Yeah, that, that's the interesting. See, minister usually is that Greek word for servant. See, minister is the Latin word, and it, it just means that. So, um, even in, um, like in England, right, you have the prime minister. He's the, he's the king's or the queen's first servant, right? And that's why 
you know, the, the Victoria has to deal with, uh, oh, uh, well, before Wellington, Wellington for a little bit, but you know, who, who's that, that first wig that, uh, uh, that they suspect has had an affair with her? Anyway, but, but, but the prime minister, the first serf, serf minister, that, that would be in Greek be the word diakonos, diakonos, where we get deacon, okay? That's not the word here. What is the word for minister in this place? What's our other choice? We've come across this before in Romans. Priest. Priest. Not priest, although priest will be part of the word that's coming up later in the, in the verse, where it gets translated priestly service, right? Right, priestly service. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Liturgist. He's a liturgist. Uh, uh, let's see. To be a liturgist of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And where does that liturgist word come from? It, it's not originally a religious word. It gets taken up by the church and becomes a religious word, but it is not a religious word at, at the time that Paul uses it here. What, is, what does liturgist mean? What, what is uh, liturgy or liturgia is, is the Greek. And you see that erg, you've got that erg in there, liturgist. Okay, where we get energy, energy, same word. That erg is the same in energy as it is in liturgy. Work, it's a work, but the lie part of liturgy has to do with the people. And so a liturgist was primarily a political term, and it referred to public servants, a public servant and the, the ceremonies and the pomp and circumstance that surrounded investing a person taking on a, the office of treasurer or mayor or king they were entering into a liturgy, a service for the people and that's how we think of our elected officials they are selfless public servants they, they, they all of them are, are sacrificing their wealth and, and their, their, their time and for the sake of the people. That's how much they love us. Okay, that's the idea. That's the idea. That's the thought. Uh, I, uh, I should have Well, I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring it for, um, for, for later. Because when we get in 16, when we get uh, the list of names, right? This is a typical, again, a typical thing in letters. Uh, we do it on our own, don't we, right? We might, you know, at the, at the tail end, you know, give my love, right, to the rest of the family, that kind of thing. And so Paul's going to do that at the end of Romans. He's going to say, all the folks that are here with me, they say hi, and be sure, and on my behalf, say hi to, you know, this person, this person, this person. Um, one, he, he's writing this from Corinth, and one of the people that he refers to as being with him, and they say hi, is a guy named Erastus. He's the city treasurer. And this is a really cool thing. If you go to Corinth in, in Greece, to this day you can find there's a stone not far from a path that leads to an amphitheater. And on that stone, carved in Latin, is reference to Erastus. This Erastus. And it says, in Latin of course, it says basically, Erastus paid for this this sidewalk with his own money for his treasurership. And, and see, the thought was, and it's not a bad one, that the guy you want to be treasurer should already be independently wealthy. That way he won't be tempted to steal. See? And so, prove you're wealthy, do a public work. Right? Pay for something that benefits the city or the town. So Erastus apparently paid for this pavement to be built that helped people get safely to the amphitheater. Public work, liturgy, liturgy. So Paul is saying, I'm a liturgist. I'm in that same vein. I'm doing a public work. I'm serving the people on Christ's behalf by bringing them the gospel. And now he's going to pair that with, you've got this, uh, I'm a liturgist of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That's his call. His call is to bring the gospel to the, the non-Jew. In the and now, if I if I had a, a board, I'd, I'd put it on on the board. Maybe it's a good thing I don't have a board because I, I always like Monday. I have that regret. I go back to the board that I wrote on for, for Sunday morning Bible class, 
And like, what am I doing? <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean it, it is, you know, 16-syllable words in Greek and Hebrew. I, I know you people. That, 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 that's not registering with you all. It, is it? Is it Rose? Okay, it, it's, it's registering with Rose. But everybody's like, I don't know what he's talking about. And so like Colt comes up with the children's message this morning, and I had this example from calculus, and I'm thinking, oh dear, this isn't going to, well, let's try. Yeah. Yeah. There, 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 there is a book out that I want to get for my, uh, my nieces and nephews, uh, Calculus for Toddlers. Yeah. Well, no, they really, yeah, that's, that's good. So I've got one of those type A uh, relatives that would appreciate that. Probably already has it, probably already has it. Maybe no. Well, here's the gift receipt. Um, the, the phrase priestly service is a compound of the word for priest and liturgy again. So I am a liturgist for Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly liturgy, in the priestly liturgy of the gospel of God. So, so that's how we should, so, so think about that. We, we now think of the person leading the service as the liturgist. But what's going on there? He is serving on behalf of this group of people, the, the community of believers, as opposed to the, the community of the town that Erastus was a liturgist for. And, and, and that's the way to understand liturgy. It's, it's not work by the people, it's God's work for the people. Something is being done for them in, in, their, in their service. Uh, and in this case, Paul's doing that. He is serving the Gentiles on behalf of Jesus by giving them, bringing them the gospel of God uh, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What was the... I'm asking this generically. Think religions in general. What's the function of the priest? To make sacrifices. To be in charge of the, the offering of the sacrifices. And the administration of, of all the things that have to do with the, the, the temple, but, but primarily sacrifices. Paul is saying he's making an offering of what? What's, he's, what, what's the sacrifice Paul's offering as priest? Dennis Dennis. Dennis. No. You, you went through a new member class, right? No, no, I'm saying, you're not still a Roman Catholic, are you? No. That, that's the Roman Catholic answer. Of course he's not saying that. He's not offering Christ's body and blood again. Heavens no. Right? Once and for all. Right? Terrible, terrible. I'm sorry, Dennis. That, no, no. But what does he say? Go to the text. Offering of what? The Gentiles. The Gentiles are the offering that Paul is making to God. God says, Paul, go get me some Gentiles. And Paul does and says, here you go. I'm offering them to you. Do you ever see yourself as that? You should. You are an offering to God. And, and exactly, right. You're dying all the time. <laughs> yeah. But Paul's job is to bring the gospel in such a way that people are brought to faith in Christ and now he can offer them to God. That's how we pastors ought to think about our function, our call as your pastors that, that, that we have a responsibility for you all. To be able to go to God and say, I, I offer you the members of, of our Redeemer as my offering to you. See? And that, that's how Paul thinks of his work. That is his call. To offer the Gentiles as a sacrifice to God. As an offering to God. Pretty cool, huh? But, but he also says that they're acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. How so? So, so, so think about it. I mean, we, we, we avoid it like the plague, even though the plagues are in Exodus, 
we avoid reading Leviticus, right? With all those rules about cleanness and uncleanness, uh, the, the, the sacrifice, what you do when you get a rash, uh, what you do when you come into contact with a dead animal, that kind of stuff. And yet, Leviticus is so important for our understanding of the Christian faith because it's all a matter of what, what makes one acceptable to God. How can one enter the presence of the Holy God when, when we of ourselves are unclean? And what happens when something unclean, as far as God is concerned, enters His presence, it gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so Leviticus, the whole book, is about the, the ways in which God has made it possible for something unclean to become clean so that it can come into contact with God and be made holy. It can be set apart by God for His use. See? So, when Paul uses this very language talking about the Gentiles, that He's made them acceptable to God, and that way they can be a pleasing sacrifice to God, how have we been made acceptable to God? Believing in Jesus. Believing in Jesus and... Our baptism. See, in our baptism, we were made clean. We were washed clean. Ananias told Paul this in his own conversion. What are you waiting for? Uh, be baptized and wash away your sins. Why? So that he could, as a now clean sinner, enter God's presence and be set apart for the use God would have for him. In this case, God's use for Paul was primarily... Go share this gospel with, with the Gentiles. See? So what's Paul doing? He's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to Gentiles. They're coming to faith. They're being baptized. They are thereby being made clean, acceptable to God. Yeah? So that's our role as pastors. And we all play that role as, as, as priests. See, we're, we're all priests by virtue of our baptism, by virtue of being Christians, not all of us are pastors. But, but that, that's always important for us to be reminded of as pastors. Right? That, that we like to think, okay, uh, you know, somehow we're special. We got some... But pastors are at least priests. See? And what does that mean? That means we are constantly striving to make people acceptable to God. And how do we do that? By bringing people the gospel. By baptizing and teaching the faith. Yeah. Um, in Christ Jesus then, see notice the in Christ Jesus, he has reason to be proud. And the word here is boast. He has reason to boast. You know, elsewhere he'll say, don't boast. <laughs> but you can boast in the Lord. And so that's what he's doing right now. He's going to boast in Christ Jesus about what? About the things Jesus has accomplished through him. Through, through, through the work that, that Paul's done. Uh, to bring the Gentiles to obedience. What's this obedience? And we've got to be very careful here, don't we? Right? He's bringing them to obedience. I've finally gotten those Gentiles to... To, to, to fly, fly rides. You know, I finally got them to to be like us good Jews. Is that what he's talking about? Key thing about the Greek word for obedience that I always love pointing out is it, it's it's a an intenser form of the word to hear. So, I mean, it makes sense, right, to obey is to, first and foremost, hear the instructions, right? But it's to obey in such a way, it's to hear in such a way that you, you leave willing to do what, you, what you've heard. Okay, obedience. But notice, Paul's going to end with this, the very last verse of Romans. Go to the very end of Romans, chapter 16, verse, 20, uh, verse 26. Verse 26. Uh, he's now been disclosed, Christ has been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the what? The obedience, the obedience of faith. 
The obedience that Paul is talking about is the obedience of the gospel. That is, hearing the good news that Jesus Christ is your Savior and saying, if you say so, God, I believe it. That's obedience. That's a, receiving the gift is obedience of faith. Uh, you know, J J Jesus will say in John 6, verse 40, you know, this is the will of the Father, that everyone look to the Son and believe in Him. No, no, no greater work than that. And that's no work at all. It's simply taking God at His word. Your sins are forgiven. The obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. So, so likewise, He's bringing the Gentiles to that obedience. He's bringing them to see Jesus, the, the Jew, the Jewish Messiah, as their Savior too. Uh, and, and, and how is this brought about? By word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the Gospel of Christ. What's the significance of saying from Jerusalem to Illyricum? Where is Illyricum? Who knows where Illyricum is? Or who wants to read their note and then pretend to have known that already? <laughs> okay, Albania, Croatia. Yeah, 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 there you go. So, think about that geographically. You've got Jerusalem. We can all recognize where Jerusalem is, the eastern end of the, the Mediterranean. What is it for him to say from there, Jerusalem, all the way to Albania? Well, what does that represent? Not the Roman Empire yet. More than that. More than Asia Minor. Pretty much everything east of Rome. See? Everything east of Rome. So, haven't been to Rome yet, and where does he want to go? He's only going to go to, go to Rome in passing to his way to Spain. Now, that represents everything. That would be the known world to Paul. And that would be the extent of the Roman Empire. You know, the Spanish province would be, Hispania would be the westernmost province. Well, no, Britannia would be. Britannia. But, but I mean, it's, it's pretty much the, almost the same longitude, right? England's a little west of, of Spain, right? Ah, check, check my maps, people. So anyway, but that's what he's saying. I, I, I've covered, I've covered everything east of you. Now I want to come to you. And then after you, I want to go to Spain. See, because that's, that's his calling. Uh, and notice he says, he wants to preach the gospel, but not where Christ has already been preached. Paul does not see it as his calling. It isn't his calling to, to, to build on someone else's foundation. He's the pioneering missionary. And then what will he do? In, in the, all the places where he plants... He'll leave someone else after him to tend. So he does the planting, someone else is going to do the watering and, and, and see that what's been planted grows. But, but after he's done that, he's, he's moving on, you see. And he also doesn't want to horn in on someone else's church. So another reason he's saying these kinds of things, well, you tell me. You're a Roman Christian reading this letter from Paul. What might you think Paul's up to with his planned trip to see? Come settle in, correct things? Okay, yeah. To, to, to settle in and maybe take over from, you know, whoever their pastor is now, right? I mean, if, if, if Dale Meyer sent our Redeemer a letter this long, and said, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in, in, in your city for a while. I would think, oh dear. <laughs> I guess I better call the district president and see where he'd like me to go next. You know that kind of thing. And see, he's assuring that I'm only passing through. I'm not there to to, to do the job of the person God's already put in place for you. Get it? We we don't know. We we do not know. Uh, it is very, oh yeah, uh, Greg's question was, who gets credit for starting the church in Rome? And, and we do not know. Dennis would say Peter. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
yeah, yeah, oh, I know, I know. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's not offering himself so much. At least that's not what he's saying. Yeah, he's offering the Gentiles. That they're the pleasing sacrifice to God. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize that I was that's off the uh, The uh, you know the Roman Catholics would want us to say Peter started Rome, but that is extremely unlikely. I mean, he ends up there. He dies there. But it is very unlikely that Peter was th there first and that he started that, uh, that, that congregation. So, but we, we just don't know. We don't, we don't know who did. So, all right. Well, much more to say. We, we, we want to move into, we want to say a little bit more about Paul's attitude about the, the, other, um, the other workers in the kingdom. That he doesn't want to step on their toes. And, and, and that has implications for the way the church has always done mission work. Right, that, that we're always looking for the place that, that doesn't already have someone to preach the gospel uh, so, so that the gospel spreads to more and more. Uh, but then we, we get into this reference to the collection of the saints, uh, which, which is uh, worth uh, reminding ourselves about. Uh, and, and, and then, then that, that, that glorious sort of parting uh, prayer for, for, for his, his own ministry as he goes to Jerusalem and what that tells us about his own feelings about going to Jerusalem with this money he's raised from the Gentile churches. It's very telling the way he puts it in his letter to the Romans. Uh, one of those, you know, it, without this, we, we wouldn't have that, we get the facts of the trip in Acts, but through the letter to the Romans, we, we get into Paul's own mind about it, uh, which is interesting. All right, uh, let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we uh, give you thanks and praise for the mercy that you have shown us in incorporating us into uh, the, the, the promises that uh, you made of old to, to the patriarchs, that uh, the, the one through whom all the nations would be blessed has come uh, to die and rise and rule for us, even us Gentiles. Uh, so that we have peace and joy. We pray that you would continue uh, to fill us with joy in your salvation and uh, to recognize that uh, because of peace with you, we have peace with one another so that we might overflow in hope in all that we say and do. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.